A car bomb hurls investigators down a dark and twisted path. At the end is one woman with many deadly secrets. A bustling emergency room is brought to its knees with the arrival of a dying woman. Scientists try to determine what might have turned her blood to toxic gas. A Florida family is mysteriously sickened. The mother suffers a lingering death. Before police can catch the killer, they must first find the source of the poison. The most subtle of killers is absolutely silent. Working from the inside out to turn its victim's body against itself. When chemistry goes wrong, scientists struggle to determine what constitutes a lethal dosage. June 28, 1983, began as a night of celebration. Judy Bueno Año met her boyfriend, John Gentry, and the women who worked at her beauty salon at a Pensacola, Florida restaurant. They gathered to present one of the employees with a pendant in honor of her birthday. As the dinner was finished and the party wore down, Judy suggested that John go to the liquor store for some champagne so they could continue celebrating elsewhere. As night fell, the streets grew quiet. But the silence would be shattered in an instant. Police and rescue raced to the scene. Gentry was rushed to the hospital, shrapnel embedded in his back. At first, investigators weren't sure if the explosion was due to mechanical failure or an attempt on Gentry's life. But even a cursory look at the crime scene revealed the blast to be no accident. It came from the trunk, an unlikely place for an explosion of that magnitude. Because bombings are a federal offense, Pensacola police notified the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. By the extent of the blast, ATF agents estimated two sticks of dynamite were used, rigged to the taillights by yellow and orange wire. Gentry was lucky to have escaped with his life. As the ATF investigated the scene and the crime photos, Pensacola police sought to find out who would benefit from Gentry's death. That task fell to Detective Ted Chamberlain. What we usually do is we look into an insurance policies of the victim, and that's what we did with Gentry. And we looked into and we found he did have a large insurance policy on him. The beneficiary was Judy Bueno Año, Gentry's girlfriend. But that wasn't surprising. The two were starting a business together. By itself, the information meant nothing. Chamberlain needed more to go on. The ATF found it. They traced the dynamite to a man in Alabama, a very close friend of Judy Bueno Año. By now, Gentry was out of intensive care. Detectives took the opportunity to talk to him about what happened, to let him know that Judy Bueno Año was the main suspect. Gentry found it difficult to believe, but then he began thinking about it. He said, you know, uh, when I'm staying over there at Judy's house, I get, I, she was giving me these pills, uh, vitamins, to make me feel better, and he said, I kept getting sick. He said, so I quit taking them, and then I felt better. He said, and I took them again and got sick again. Gentry had been so ill, he'd spent time in the hospital. There, he recovered completely, though his doctor wasn't sure what was wrong with him. Once Gentry returned home, he relapsed. 
pills for you, right? Finally, he stopped taking the vitamin pills and his health returned. He felt his days of illness were behind him. And then his car blew up. Sensing a connection, the detective asked Gentry if he'd saved any of the capsules. Do you have a business partner? As a matter of fact, he had. They were supposedly a popular vitamin C supplement. Chamberlain sent them to the lab for analysis. Finding out what something isn't is easier than finding out what it is. The process of elimination began with a comparison of the capsules with vitamin C. It proved there was not a speck of the vitamin in the capsules. That discovery alone ramped up the suspicion that the pills were poisoned. But what was in them? The substance in the capsules was dissolved and tested. Some tests analyzed its chemical makeup, others measured the wavelengths of light it absorbed. By comparing these results with a database of chemicals, the compound was identified. The capsules were found to contain a substance called paraformaldehyde. It has no known medical use. In fact, it's considered a class three poison, which means it's moderately toxic. John Trestrail of the Blodgett Poison Control Center is a poisoning expert. According to him, if murder was the motive, paraformaldehyde wasn't the best choice. When it breaks down, to formaldehyde, which we know is used to preserve bodies, uh, is very irritating. It, it wouldn't be a very good poison to pick for homicidal reasons. It would be more irritating, you know, irritating to the eyes, irritating to the respiratory tract. And I suppose in chronic exposures, we know formaldehyde can cause cancer. Will you search for Gentry's story, bolstered by the tampered pills and the explosion, gave Chamberlain ample grounds to obtain search warrants for Bueno Año's home and beauty salon. At her house, they found more vitamin capsules. Basket. Oh, I got something. In her son's closet, Orange they found wire. wire that resembled the wire used to blow up the car. Got a wire here. So we sent that off to the lab, and they sent us back pictures of the wire and the color coding and striations of the wire. Take one taken from the piece of the bomb that was gone and the one from the boy's room and you put them together, it was just like matching up ballistics on bullets. I mean, they looked exactly alike. And that was real good evidence. Hi, I'm Detective Robert Beasley. This is an investigation. While one group of officers searched the house, another group was at work collecting chemicals from Bueno Año's salon. For Judy Bueno Año, paraformaldehyde would be a poison of opportunity. The chemical is used in beauty salons as a disinfectant. With evidence of the bomb and the poison, police had ample grounds to arrest her on suspicion. The bombing made her a suspect in a federal crime. The ATF's jurisdiction stretched beyond Florida to all 50 states. Having failed at both poisoning and blowing up her lover, Bueno Año seemed like a two-time loser. But as investigators checked her background, they began to suspect that she may have just been in a slump. As news of Judy Bueno Año's arrest spread, Detective Chamberlain received a call from the mother of one of her ex-boyfriends in Alabama, a man named Bobby Joe Morris, a man who had died mysteriously. Her son and Judy lived together, and she had a very strong suspicion that he didn't die of natural causes, that she had poisoned or killed her son. Bueno Año had pressured Bobby Joe's mother to cremate the body, but she refused. Chamberlain promised he'd look into the matter. 
everybody that we talk to, they all seem to be a little bit scared of Judy, a little bit afraid of her, that she, uh, she would always make up these incredible stories is what we were hearing from her. And uh, we even talked to one witness that uh, the witness said that uh, she, uh, Judy had told this girl, said, look, if you don't like your husband, poison him. With stories of Bobby Joe Morris and others coming to light, police began to suspect that John Gentry wasn't Bueno Año's first victim. They found that her life, at least on the surface, appeared touched by tragedy. But a closer inspection suggested something more diabolical. Judy lost her husband, James Goodyear, in 1971. Three months after he returned from Vietnam, he lapsed into delirium and died. What a great day for a yeah. After his death, Judy changed her name from Judy Goodyear to Judy Bueno Año, the Spanish translation of her husband's surname. The deeper Chamberlain dug, the darker Judy's past became. Bodies were beginning to tumble out of her closet. You'd open up one door and go in, and, and, and it would lead to you about five or six more doors. That was the problem with her. You know, it just, it just didn't, it didn't look like it was ever going to stop, you know. We kept finding bodies everywhere. One of those bodies was her own son, Michael Goodyear. He joined the Army in 1979. Shortly after visiting his mother while on leave, he became ill. Tests showed exposure to arsenic. Because his job involved working with the substance, it was assumed that he'd inadvertently ingested some. He soon began to lose the use of his arms and legs, and he was discharged. His first day home, Judy and her youngest son took Michael on a canoe trip near their home. Despite the fact that Michael wore heavy braces, he had no life jacket. In the middle of the lake, the boat capsized and Michael drowned. Back then, it seemed like a tragic, if stupid, accident. But now, Chamberlain wasn't so certain. Too many men in Judy Bueno Año's life had come to an untimely end. A sinister pattern was taking shape. While Judy awaited her day in court for the attempted murder of John Gentry, Chamberlain gathered evidence of homicide she may have gotten away with, at least so far. He learned that Judy's husband, James Goodyear, showed symptoms consistent with any number of illnesses, among them arsenic poisoning. If he was poisoned, the evidence was buried with him. Twelve years after his death, his body was ordered exhumed to look for proof. And when you exhume a body looking for one of the heavy metals like lead, thallium, arsenic, antimony, these are all elements. Elements have been around since the solar system was created. They're just as detectable today as they were 250 million years ago and 250 million years down the road from now. So when you talk about digging up a body looking for arsenic, if it was in that body when it went in the ground, it's going to be in that body until it disintegrates. Goodyear had been autopsied at the time of his death, but the medical examiner wasn't looking for poison, so he didn't find any. Almost anything can be poisonous if enough is swallowed, so no single test can be used to detect all poisons. The analyst must be guided by his knowledge of the symptoms so he can narrow the field and test for specific poisons. Arsenic tends to concentrate in the heart, liver, lungs, and kidneys. Samples of each were tested for the toxin. Arsenic can take down a person in an hour or a year, depending on how much he ingests. A single large dose kills quicker than small doses over a longer time. A faster death means the poison would have less time to damage organs. Goodyear's lingering death suggested cumulative long-term poisoning. The ravaged condition of his organs bore that out. 
The diagnosis was crucial and incriminating because it made accidental poisoning less likely. Since James and Judy Goodyear lived in the same house, it seemed reasonable that they'd both be exposed to arsenic if the hazard were present. But Judy never showed any symptoms. Next, the medical examiner set out to determine how much arsenic was present in Goodyear's system. The victim's hair and nails provided a handy yardstick. A complete fingernail was removed from the nail bed and dissolved in acid. The resulting solution was put in an instrument called an atomic absorption spectrometer that determines the concentration of arsenic in the sample. The amount of arsenic a person swallows is proportional to the amount in the victim's hair and nails. The medical examiner could tell that the levels were too high to have come from the environment. And since hair grows at a set rate, he could use it to see how long Goodyear had been given the poison. He determined that the contaminated portion of the hair was consistent with three months' growth. James Goodyear had been home from the Navy three months before he died. The evidence suggested that Judy had wasted no time doing away with her husband. Shortly after James Goodyear's autopsy, Judy's boyfriend and second suspected victim, Bobby Joe Morris, was exhumed. His hair and nails contained enough arsenic to kill 11 men. It appeared that over a 12-year period, Judy Bueno Año managed to fatally poison two men and poison and drown a third. Other men in her life had also met mysterious ends, but she was never prosecuted for their deaths. The motive in every case was insurance money. Ironically, it was the one who got away, John Gentry, that ultimately exposed her deadly game. Her botched attempt to poison him forced her to resort to using a bomb. On the surface, the choice may seem bizarre, but to poison expert John Trestrail, the difference between bombs and poisons is only a matter of degree. I uh, personally believe there's a great similarity between the psychological profile of a bomber and a poisoner. Because what is a poison other than a chemical bomb that doesn't make any noise? The effect is the same. You blow up the victim. Poisoning is more subtle and may at first go undetected. But there's no statute of limitations on murder. And poison leaves its traces for a very long time. One clue is all it takes to expose the truth. And of course, every poisoner looks for the perfect poison that's undetectable. And my answer is, what would you call it? If it's got a name, don't you have to see something to name it? And if you see it, is it not detectable? So there is no perfect, non-detectable poison. Judy Bueno Año received 12 years for bombing Gentry's car life in prison for the drowning death of her son and is on death row for poisoning her husband. For the death of Bobby Joe Morris, there was simply no punishment left to give her. She is one of only 48 women ever sentenced to death in the United States. It took years for Bueno Año's methodical poisonings to catch up with her, but once her villainy was revealed, the evidence was irrefutable. Across the country, scientists faced a more perplexing dilemma. How could the body of a dying woman poison the staff of an emergency room? Just after 8 p.m. on February 9, 1994, paramedics whisked 31-year-old Gloria Ramirez into the emergency room at California's Riverside Hospital. Her boyfriend called because she collapsed and had trouble breathing. The paramedics related to the ER staff that the patient had cervical cancer, but she hadn't yet begun chemotherapy. In fact, 
there was nothing in her record to prepare the ER for what was to come. When Ramirez arrived at the emergency room, she already had an oxygen mask on her face. Then her heart rhythm began to fluctuate, and the staff tried to shock it back to normal. It wasn't working. A nurse drew blood to run some tests. And that's when the well-choreographed chaos of the emergency room began to fall to pieces. Ramirez's body began to take on an oily sheen. The nurse drawing the blood complained of a strange odor. She handed the hypodermic to a physician. Then she passed out. The odor, something like garlic or ammonia, increased. Beige crystals were noticed in the blood sample. Suddenly, another nurse fell. In short order, another nurse became dizzy and went to the nurse's station to rest. There, she lost consciousness. Her arms and legs began to shake uncontrollably. Occasionally, she'd stop breathing. Then one of the doctors succumbed. Ramirez was still not stabilized. An emergency was declared as attendants rushed in to clear the collapsing staff and attend to Ramirez. As the emergency room was evacuated, gurneys were wheeled into the parking lot. Unable to cope with the bizarre onslaught, Riverside sent its staff and patients to other hospitals. The caregivers suddenly became the patients. Bedlam ruled, and at its center lay a helpless, dying woman. Within 15 minutes of contact with Gloria Ramirez, 27 of the 37 staff members at Riverside Hospital suffered strange symptoms. Respiratory therapist Maureen Welch was one of them. After I awoke, um, outside was very sick. Uncontrollable tremors, nausea, retching, um, difficulty breathing. Um, my vision felt kind of limited at that time. I could only see things close to me. There was simply no explaining what could have caused the symptoms. Many of those affected recovered quickly. Others spent weeks in the hospital. Within 35 minutes of Ramirez's arrival at the hospital, she was pronounced dead. The crisis had passed, but the mystery deepened. Her body was sealed in two plastic bags and an airtight casket before being moved to the hospital morgue. To find the cause of the catastrophe, the Riverside Hazardous Materials, or HAZMAT team, arrived suited for battle. Ductwork, sewage lines, plumbing, and waste disposal were thoroughly checked. The air in the emergency room was electronically sniffed for toxic gases, solvents, or chemicals. Nothing was overlooked, and nothing could explain what happened. Once the emergency room was given a clean bill of health, suspicions turned to the patient. An autopsy revealed nothing extraordinary. Gloria Ramirez died of kidney failure as a result of her cancer. Dissatisfied with the findings and desperate for an explanation, hospital officials sent blood and tissue samples from Ramirez to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, 60 miles east of San Francisco. Solvents were added to Ramirez's blood sample. Organic chemicals in the blood were dissolved, 
leaving water and blood cells behind. The result is a highly concentrated extract of the chemicals in the blood. Brian Andresen is the director of the center. Here in our, uh, our laboratory are very precise analytical tools that allow us to look at every chemical that we extract from the blood sample and actually determine the chemical structure and even get concentrations, all down at ultra low concentrations. Identifying the chemicals took a two-pronged approach. First, the extract of Ramirez's blood was heated in a gas chromatograph until it vaporized. Because every chemical vaporizes at a different rate, the components separated. The spectrometer then identified each chemical by reading the patterns of light they emitted. The results were then plotted on a computer in the form of peaks and valleys. What would Ramirez's blood reveal? Every peak here is a different, unique chemical that was in the blood of Mrs. Ramirez. And things stand out, it's very obvious. This is all Tylenol or acetaminophen is right here. Cholesterol is here, other drugs, and a very unusual chemical that we initially discovered, which was right here. We don't know what it is at this moment, but luckily we have libraries that when you actually search a library in the computer, it will print out what this chemical is. It turned out to be a high concentration of a chemical called dimethyl sulfone, or DMSO2. It comes from the breakdown of another chemical, DMSO, or dimethyl sulfoxide. Though it's manufactured as an industrial lubricant, DMSO is used by thousands of athletes and arthritis sufferers to relieve pain. It's conceivable that Ramirez was using it for this purpose. But its waste product, DMSO2, is not toxic, even in the high concentrations found in her tissues. Its presence did nothing to explain why the emergency room was brought to its knees. From his findings, Andresen had to conclude he'd found nothing to account for the harrowing events on the night Ramirez died. Without any physical explanation for what was now being called the Ramirez incident, the California Department of Health Services wrote it off to mass hysteria due to stress. The health care workers were not buying it. My response to the claim of mass hysteria was not something that I can entertain personally because the people involved in emergency care, and in particular this emergency room, were all like a well-oiled machine. They'd all had tons of experience, 15 or years better, veterans of all types of occurrences, and this was just something else that they had to take care of. And uh, you, can't, you can't argue with that. I mean, these people are not generally hysterical. Unwilling to accept the ruling of the health department, Welch did some homework of her own. She knew that many of her colleagues, and she herself, had suffered long-term health problems, not the sort of symptoms induced by mass hysteria. She gathered up lab reports, medical records, and contacted Brian Andresen. Andresen and his colleague, Deputy Director Patrick Grant, looked over the data Welch sent them. They focused on the one compound that didn't seem to fit. Basically, I came back into my office and started looking up compounds in the chemist Bible, the Merck Index. Mm -hmm. Looked up dimethyl sulfoxide and dimethyl sulfone, and fortunately, um, they're right there together in language even a, a nuclear chemist can understand. And um, at that point, I realized that oxidation was the connector between the two. If Ramirez was taking DMSO on her own to relieve her pain, it seemed plausible the extra oxygen she was given on the way to the hospital could have sped the chemical's transformation to its waste product, DMSO2. DMSO is oily and has a garlicky smell. That could explain the sheen on Ramirez's skin and the odor in the emergency room. But it didn't explain why so many people were sickened. 
Pat Grant began to formulate a theory. On the same page in the drug manual as DMSO and DMSO2 was an entry for DMSO4. The only difference between the two compounds was more oxygen, but it was a crucial difference. DMSO2 is a harmless vapor. DMSO4 is a deadly nerve gas. And if you read the toxicities and the various symptoms that people that are exposed to dimethyl sulfate experience, um, it was quite similar to the Riverside incident. Grant's theory sounded good on paper, but no one had ever turned harmless DMSO2 into deadly DMSO4 in the lab by simply adding more oxygen. If Grant was asserting that a dying woman could somehow change into a canister of nerve gas, he was going to have to prove it. The scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory had a daunting task ahead of them. To see if DMSO2 could turn into its deadly cousin, DMSO4, in the emergency room, they had to replicate the conditions during the last few minutes of Gloria Ramirez's life. The work was assigned to analytical chemist Rich Whipple. The first obstacle was the nature of the two substances. While harmless DMSO2 dissolves in blood, deadly DMSO4 doesn't. So how could the compound be in Ramirez's veins? The answer is, it couldn't. Our belief is that she had DMSO2 in the blood, and then when it was withdrawn from her system, it was then converted to DMSO4. The chemical event, if it happened at all, happened in the syringe. Using a substitute for human blood, Whipple performed an experiment to show how a change in temperature could change the form of the chemical. At body temperature, DMSO2 stays dissolved in the solution. But cooled to room temperature, it forms crystals. Crystals like the ones witnessed by some of the emergency room staff. In her body, Ramirez's blood was 98.6 degrees. But the portion drawn into the syringe was immediately cooled to around 64 degrees, the temperature of the emergency room. The drastic temperature change may have caused the DMSO2 crystals to separate out. Everything about the theory seemed to be holding together except one crucial point. Whipple didn't manage to produce any detectable DMSO4. But lab tests can never perfectly replicate a real life situation. In the emergency room, only the slightest amount of DMSO4 would have been needed to sicken all those staffers. One tenth of a gram of the substance can be lethal. In smaller doses, DMSO4 can cause long-term nerve damage and other lingering health problems. A year or more after the Ramirez incident, some of the staffers in the emergency room still had symptoms. Grant believes this is further evidence in favor of a chemical explanation, not mass hysteria or some other psychological cause. In comparison to the other theories that were out there before we proposed our chemical theory, I would believe it over mass hysteria of an experienced emergency room staff. Though Grant's findings are generally accepted, many scientists await further proof before they're convinced. Until the mechanism for the deadly transformation is fully understood, there remains a slim chance that the Ramirez incident could happen again. The events in Riverside's emergency room highlight how toxic hazards can come from the least likely sources. That's a fact poisoners use to their advantage. Since anything can be a poison, the killer can hide his weapon in plain sight. At 7 a.m., October 23, 1988, Peggy Carr arrived at a restaurant in Alturas, Florida, where she worked as a waitress. As she waited for her shift to start, 
she began to feel ill. Soon her legs started to burn and pain racked her chest. She thought she was having a heart attack. One of the regulars, a former army medic, checked her pulse and reassured her that whatever was ailing her, it wasn't her heart. But the pain continued to grow. Peggy was sent home to rest. The pain was unrelenting, and Peggy's family sent her to the hospital. She was admitted and placed under observation. Sixteen hours after her first symptoms, Peggy Carr was practically incapacitated, and her position was stumped. Three days and a battery of tests later, doctors were no closer to making a diagnosis. Then, just as mysteriously as they had begun, Peggy's symptoms began to fade. She was sent home. But within a week, the crushing pain gripped her again. She was rushed back to the hospital. Besides the intense pain in her limbs and joints, her hair began to fall out, and she was becoming unable to move. Good. Tests okay, still great. showed nothing wrong with her. Nodes. Okay. Doctors thought some good. virus had nestled in her nervous system. Okay. She told her yes. neurologist that she felt like she was I'm walking on hot I'm coals. You're getting the a description brought hands. to mind yeah. something he'd okay. only read about. No. Do you know? He decided to try one more test for thallium poisoning. Thallium is a natural element found in trace amounts in soil and water. Its purified form is strictly regulated. Up until 1972, when it was banned in the United States, it was used in rat and ant poisons. Tests showed that Peggy Carr's system had 20,000 times the amount of thallium one might expect to find. The poison was eating away her nervous system. There was no cure. At first, Peggy's poisoning was considered accidental. Tests on her family revealed that everyone in the Carr household had traces of it. The Polk County Sheriff's Department and the Health Department combed the Carr's house to find the source of the contaminant. Detective Ernie Mincy led the investigation. Our sole purpose was to identify that poison and have her removed from the environment to prevent further injury to any of the persons. Over the next month, investigators collected food, water, and soil samples in the car's home and neighborhood. Everything was sent to the lab to be tested. After an impatient wait, every test came back negative. Good. Investigators were desperate to find the source of the poison. Meanwhile, Peggy could no longer breathe on her own and lapsed into a coma. The search for the poison oh, continued. Can I have some more bags, How many please? others would be sickened before it was found? Among the items collected from the car's house were returnable bottles of Coca-Cola. One of them was broken. All had residue on the bottom. Like everything else, they were sent off for analysis. The bottles joined the ranks of dozens of items collected from the car's house. Each had been subjected to the same test. Each had been eliminated. Investigators hoped to have better luck with the bottles. To test for thallium, the residue was dissolved in nitric acid. A sample was placed in a graphite tube and vaporized. Then a lamp with a thallium filament was shined into the tube. The test relies on the principle that every compound emits a specific wavelength of light. An instrument called a spectrophotometer measured the amount of light absorbed by the sample. It showed that the bottles contained more than 11 times the level of the toxin one might expect to find. Finally, the source of the poison had been found. But how did thallium get into the soft drink? 
Were others out there waiting to be consumed? Mincy feared a manufacturing catastrophe or malicious tampering. With the assistance of the FBI and the Coca-Cola Company, the lot numbers were traced back to the store, the warehouse, and the bottling plant. The search came up clean. No other bottles had been tainted, and there'd been no other reports of poisoning. The tainted bottles were specific to the car's home. But who would have done it? A poisoner must have intimate contact with his victim's surroundings in order to plant the toxin. That's why most poisonings are done within families. That's up for grabs. And that's why suspicion fell on Pi Carr. Pi was Peggy's second husband. They'd been married only a few months when Peggy grew ill. But it seemed their honeymoon was long over. Mincy learned that just prior to the poisoning, the cars had an argument that resulted in Peggy spending the night in a hotel. The weekend her symptoms first appeared, Pi was conveniently out of town on a hunting trip. When he returned, he'd resisted taking his wife to the hospital. Everything seemed to point to Pi Carr. But convictions aren't made on such circumstantial evidence. Mincy's criminal investigation had just begun. More evidence needed to be gathered. More leads followed. It's in here somewhere, fellas. Carr's every move was scrutinized. Almost as an afterthought, he presented a convenient clue in his own defense. He showed detectives a threatening note he claimed he received two weeks before the poisoning. The cars didn't pay much attention to it at the time, but Pi kept it just in case. This note indicated that ever who had written it wanted the entire family to move out of the state of Florida or else they would die. The note, along with the fact that Pi Carr had consumed some of the tainted soft drink, weakened the accusations against him. But he wasn't home free yet. He could have written the note himself and taken the poison intentionally to deflect the pall of guilt. Mincy kept his eye on Pi Carr while he sought other suspects. Who would want to kill the family? Mincy learned that the cars didn't get along with their neighbors, George Trapal and his wife, Diana. Several weeks before the poisoning, Peggy and Diana almost came to blows over the car's loud music. It hardly seemed like grounds for attempted murder. To find out more about the icy relationship between the neighbors, Mincy paid a visit to George Trapal. Tripal's reaction to the subject of the cars was unexpectedly harsh. He had went into a tirade about the problems with these red-necked ch children and family that lived next to, to him. Uh, uh, their kids make all kinds of noise, play the radio real loud. Then Mincy asked him why he thought anyone might want to harm the family. Uh, I don't care what they do. He quoted the threatening letter the cars had received weeks before verbatim. He said exactly what was in a note. Nobody else knew of its existence, nobody else except law enforcement. At that moment, George Tripal became the prime suspect. But Mincy had no more to go on with Tripal than he had with Pi Carr. So he began looking into Tripal's surprising past. Tripal was an eccentric man who enjoyed creating games and crafting scenarios. He also belonged to Mensa, an elite society of people whose IQs are among the top 2% in the world. He and his wife were trained chemists. What's more, the quirky genius had done time for masterminding one of the largest amphetamine manufacturing operations in the Southeast. Thallium is sometimes used to make amphetamines. According to John Trestrail, Tripal had the means, 
and the mind to orchestrate a poisoning. They can plan a script of a death. Uh, she'll be here and she'll be eating this and then she'll do this and I'll do this and it's all laid out. So I think this takes a great deal of, of, in, of intelligence to plan this out. This is not a brute force weapon. This is mind, not muscle. But what would his motive be? In his prison records, Mincy found a letter Tripal wrote complaining to officials about his fellow inmates' radios. As hard as it was to believe, loud music seemed to be an overwhelming sore point for him. On March 3rd, 1989, Peggy Carr died after lingering in a coma for three months. Mincy now had to prove that Tripal was a murderer. With nothing but the flimsiest circumstantial evidence, Mincy couldn't get a search warrant for Tripal's house. The only way to crack this case was to outsmart the certified genius. After several months of background checks on George Tripal, Detective Mincy was confident he poisoned Peggy Carr. All he needed was proof. But Tripal was too clever to leave clues out in the open. Mincy needed to get inside his house and get inside his head. To carry it off, he needed someone to befriend the alleged killer, win his confidence, and then betray it. For this deadly game, he counted on Special Agent Susan Gorick. She became Sherry Gwynn, a woman on the verge of divorce who counted on Tripal's shoulders to cry on. She met him at a party that he organized for Mensa members. Its theme was murder. I learned a lot about his personality and about his habits, uh, about his associates. Um, one of the things that I learned was that he did have a, a large ego. I, I did use my personality of Sherry to play off of that ego and to get him to talk more. And I used that to my advantage. The friendship blossomed slowly, forcing Gorick to maintain her Sherry Gwynn persona for a full year. All the while, she lived in fear that Tripal would see through her masquerade, putting her life in danger. Slowly, she gathered what evidence she could to build her case, hoping he'd tip his hand. As the months went by, she didn't have much. I gained a multitude of small evidence, small statements that all put together was overwhelming. But if you looked at one small statement, it did not look like a lot of evidence. Okay, we, and, uh, like so playing an excruciating more. game of hangman, uh, Gorick slowly exactly drew her picture of Tripal as the murderer. So much but even after a year, she was still waiting to add that final stroke essential to win the game. Finally, in December 1989, Gorick got the break she needed. Tripal and his wife moved out of town and allowed Sherry Gwynn to rent their house. As a tenant, she could search the entire property without a warrant. She'd gotten all she could out of Tripal. Perhaps now his house would give up his secrets. She called in the Polk County Crime Scene Unit. They combed the premises, collecting whatever they could find. Believing Tripal would be too smart to have kept any thallium around his house, they looked for its telltale residue. I truly believe that if we were going to find thallium, that it would probably be either in the air conditioning filter or possibly down one of the drains. And we spent a lot of time with the crime scene people swabbing the drains, trying to get any residue that he may have poured out. While some investigators were in the house looking for trace evidence, others collected vials of chemicals from the garage. Everything was labeled and sent to the FBI for analysis. Months went by before the results came back. I assume because it took so long with the lab report that they didn't find anything. 
But Gorick was wrong. When the reports came back, they showed that one of the vials picked up from the workbench in Trapal's garage contained thallium powder. For Gorick and Mincy, 15 months of deception paid off. The evidence to convict George Trapal of poisoning the cars was in hand. At Trapal's trial, it was clear that he was a killer without a conscience. Like the murder weekend party he organized, death was just a game to him. George Trapal had absolutely no remorse for his actions. He justified it with his superior intelligence and the fact that people with lesser intelligence did not deserve to live on this planet. Unlike most poisoners, Tripal's motive was neither love nor money. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He wanted to kill his neighbors simply because he found them annoying. According to John Trestrail, the ego that led him to think so little of others ultimately led to his own demise. The container containing the evidence was left in his home. Why would he do that? Here's a very intelligent man. Didn't he look down the road to say, I better get rid of this bottle. Now his ego said, they'll never get this far. They'll never figure out how this happened. A jury found George Trapal guilty of 14 felony counts, including first degree murder in the death of Peggy Carr. He was sentenced to death. As we go about our daily lives, most of us seldom think about the toxic world we live in. In the past, that lack of diligence provided the poisoner's greatest opportunity. But now, science is catching up. More than ever, unexplained deaths are viewed with suspicion. And in the lab, more of those suspicions are being justified.